Thank you, Christian, by the way. It's good to look around your church and see young people, by the way, college age, 20s, 30s. They have this passion about them. And it, when you get older, it's kind of convicting, you know, because you see their passion and whatever. So anyway, thank God for them. Thank the Lord for you. And happy Passion Week, by the way. The week of Jesus' suffering, which ultimately led to his cross. And I hope you do come back out on Good Friday. I'm going to be doing a message on the seven sayings of the cross. And I'll do seven sayings in 15 minutes. So we won't be here long. But it's basically something to give us a way to set our heart and our mind on exactly what Jesus did for us on that wonderful Good Friday for us. Not so very good for him, but very good for us. This past week, I was in Karen's car and it's about eight years old, I guess, and it has its own navigation system in it. And I'm not sure what button that I pushed. I'm sure I did it, but I was in Radford, and I was on my way here, and I knew exactly where I wanted to go, and I knew all the roads. But somehow or another, this car starts talking to me. <laughs> and so I'm fine. Y'all are laughing. I'm pushing buttons, trying to figure out how to cut this thing off, and the more I push it, the louder she gets and the more she talks. And I know exactly where I'm going, and she says, you need to make a U-turn immediately. Turn left on this road. So I'm trying to turn the radio up just a little bit to drown her out. She interrupts the radio. So finally, it became so distracting, I thought, I'm going to have to pull over to the side of the road and turn this woman off because she's driving me crazy. And I push a button, and I don't know if there's OnStar or what there is, but all these, it starts beeping, and I'm thinking, it's connecting me to, you know, somebody I, finally, I stopped and finally got it turned off. And I thought to myself, you know, that is how life is. We know the direction that God wants us to go. And we hear all these voices on every side. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? You shouldn't be doing If you were supposed to be doing this, it'd be easy. You shouldn't be making U-turns. Jesus faced exactly the same truth. He knew exactly where he was going. He knew exactly what he was going to do. And he heard all these voices telling him something completely different. Is my PowerPoint up, Brittany? There it is. So this morning, I'm going to direct your attention to Matthew chapter 17 as we talk about the transfiguration of Jesus. Now, by the way, this this happened right before the Passion Week, which is what Palm Sunday is really about. It's when Jesus presented himself as Israel's king. He rode in on a donkey. The palm leaves were laid down as a sign of royalty. And as Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the crowds started shouting, Hosanna. And the religious leaders tried to quiet them. And Jesus said, if they don't cry out, the rocks will. As you ultimately know, the people who cried for him ultimately had him crucified on a cross as one unit, as you would say it, as they all fulfilled God's will, not knowing it. But prior to this occasion, when Jesus mentioned that he would be rejected, he told them, I will go, and I will be rejected and crucified by men. Prior to that occurrence, he did something that is very interesting because only three people who were his apostles witnessed this with him. And so this amazing story tells us one central truth, and here it is. And I hope this helps you in your life. When times are difficult, God always offers hope and encouragement to us if we have eyes to see it. Prior to this occasion, if you go back in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus told his disciples, the Son of Man must uh, must go and suffer and be crucified and rise again. Peter, the lead spokesman of the apostles, rebuked Jesus. I mean, he literally went to Jesus and said, Not so, Lord. (laughs) This will never happen. And Jesus looked at him and said, Get behind me, Satan. I mean, you are acting exactly like Satan did when I was tempted trying to get me to avert the cross. And he told him, he said, You are speaking the things that are good for you. You want me to be the king want me to do all this because you think this is how it goes, but Peter, you don't know what you're talking about. You have to listen to what God tells me to do, and I know that my hour is soon to come. And so when everything seems lost, God gives us glimmers of hope and encouragement. He gives flickers of light 
to get us through. And that, by the way, is the story of life. When you feel like everything has been knocked out from under your feet, God may bring someone into your life to share some truth with you. God may bring a message or a book or a resource into your life to give you just a little glimmer of hope to let you know that you know, you're not in heaven yet and you're not in God's glory yet, but that day is soon to come. I personally think the reason that Jesus pulled aside Peter, James, and John was because perhaps they were so discouraged and they were so downhearted knowing that Jesus was going to die that he was going to teach them a lesson, not only about their life, but about who he was. So as we think about this, I'm going to go back and forth between Matthew, one account in Luke, to kind of weave together some of these parts that one author may not have focused on to show you the complete picture of what we have of the transfiguration. But before we do, I want to pray. So Father, as we open your word this morning, help us to see just how much you think of Jesus, who he is, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. May he be magnified and glorified today. Guard my mind, my mouth. May I say only the things that bring honor and glory to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 17, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. The word transfigured here is the word metamorphosis. It's where we get this concept of something changing, not because of the outside, but because of the inside. This is what happens to a butterfly, by the way. You see a caterpillar. The caterpillar changes to a butterfly, not because it is a butterfly. Uh, you don't see that initially, but that is actually what is inside this caterpillar. So this metamorphous term explains what Jesus, what happened to him. It wasn't something that happened from the outside. This was who he was and what he veiled from human eyes. He was metamorphosed before them. Notice what the text says, and his face shone like the sun. Now, I don't know if you've done this recently. You can experiment today. I don't recommend it. But walk out in the sun sometime and just with no sunglasses, just take you a peek for a while. Now, don't do that, by the way. <laughs> it's almost like it, it's just so overwhelming that you can't stand to see. And this is what he's trying to describe, that the glory of Jesus was so bright that he could not, they just couldn't even see it. It just blinded them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Luke adds a detail here that Matthew didn't. He said, and as he was praying, Jesus on the mountain was praying. As he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. So from Matthew's account, you get the emphasis on the face. From Luke's account... You get the emphasis on his clothing and his entire body. So what you have here is a picture of the glorified Jesus who is radiant from head to toe. Back in Matthew, And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now I need to pause here for a minute because if you don't know the story of Moses, Moses was the lawgiver of Israel who God directed to lead the people out of Egypt into the promised land. And Moses was the man who received the Ten Commandments from God. Moses also went up on a mountain, by the way, and Moses also took three men with him. And Moses' face also began to shine. But there was a huge difference between Moses' shining and Jesus' glory because Moses had a reflected glory. He was in God's presence and he was reflecting what he saw. Whereas inside Jesus, it was something that was internal and it came out. It was unveiled. But two men, Moses and Elijah, who was the beginning of the prophets, if you will. Moses represents the law. Elijah represented the prophets. And both the law and the prophets 
pointed toward the Messiah. And they both had something to say, and that was that the Messiah would be God, he would be worshipped, he would be an Israelite. When he comes, people should listen to him because he's going to fulfill God's plan. But then the prophets go on and say that he will suffer, he will die, he will be glorified, and then he will reign. And so Moses and Elijah are pointing toward God's Messiah, the person of Jesus, and they appear before him. Something else interesting is that, if you know, Moses went up on Mount Nebo to die, and according to the book of Jude, his body was never found. And it says that Satan was hunting for his body, but God hid it, and Satan never did find it. And so now all of a sudden you see Moses in some type of glorified body, a pre-glorified body, but it, it wasn't his old physical body. And you see Elijah, who was taken up in a chariot in a whirlwind, who were there with Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but this is rather interesting because later in the story, Peter stands back and says, it's Moses and Elijah. I mean, he knew them. He had never had an iPhone picture of them, never seen a text, never seen a snap, but he knew them by name. And by the way, they were talking with Jesus. I'll come back to that in just a moment. If we go to the book of Luke, we find out what they were talking about. Matthew doesn't say this, but Luke does. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory. That's another interesting phrase there. They appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. Apparently, Peter was allowed to listen in on a private conversation. And perhaps Moses and Elijah were there saying, You know, Lord, we talked about you thousands and thousands of years before this. And people laughed at us. They mocked us. They scorned us. They said, You are crazy talking about something so far. I mean, this is the most silly faith. And they said, You know what? In light of what they mocked, we knew you would come. And we know that your day is coming. And Moses perhaps stood back and said, Even though I was the giver of the Ten Commandments and a friend of God, I am unworthy as John the Baptist to even touch the laces of your shoes. And perhaps Elijah said, Oh Lord, I knew you were coming. I saw your glory when I went up in the chariot. And you didn't let me tell anybody else about it. You veiled it in mystery and you came as a baby in the womb of a virgin girl. You grew up and had your diaper changed and lived among men and people thought you were just an ordinary carpenter's son. And lo and behold, here you are on your way to the Father's plan, to the cross He set before you. But Lord Jesus, after you die on that cross, you're going to rise from the dead. And we don't know when you're coming back, but the glory that you're in now is the glory that you're going to return in. And we are so thankful to be here. I don't know what they said, but I can imagine it was something along that line. They spoke about his exodus. If you look in the Greek text, that's literally what the word is. It is his exodus. Because of that, some people see similarities of Jesus going up on this mountain and they believe Matthew is relating here somehow to Moses' experience going up on the mountain. For example, uh, when Moses went on Mount Sinai, Jesus went on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses took Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Moses saw the glory of God and his face shone from speaking with God. Jesus was transfigured with a glory that was not reflected but authentically his own. And a greater one than Moses had come, for as the writer to Hebrews said, Moses was faithful as a servant in all of God's house, but Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house. And at Sinai, a, div a divine voice spoke, and we're going to see in just a minute, another voice is going to speak. So perhaps there was some similarities, but I think there's also some more issues that's going on as to why this is important. But listen to what Matthew goes on to say. And Peter said to Jesus, you know, by the way, we try to teach our kids, sometimes it's best just to be quiet. 
Peter couldn't help himself. Peter makes this statement. He said, Lord, it is so good that we're here. I mean, we're so glad to be here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, by the way, back in the Jewish Feast of Booths, it was a long festivity, and one of the things they would do, you know, God came down and dwelt with men, so they would make these temporary booths to represent God's presence in their midst. And Peter perhaps thought they were going to be up there for a long time, and he was offering to make a nice suggestion, and he said, how about I make a booth for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you, and you know, I'll just have it all ready. Now notice what happens. He was still speaking. And behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, Hush! This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Peter, the one you're seeing here is not an equal with Moses or Elijah. He is God. You don't make three booths, one for Moses and one for Elijah and one for Jesus and say that's a happy little trinity. That's not the trinity. Peter, you be quiet and listen to him. Notice what the text says. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and they were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And I love this passage, by the way. J. Vernon McGee preached a whole message on this little short phrase here. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now, if you want to hear some good preaching, go online and type in J. Vernon McGee, Jesus only. He was out in Los Angeles amidst all the liberals and all of the liberalism that was going on that day, and McGee stands up and talks about it's Jesus and Jesus only. And I mean for 45 minutes, he laid out the wood. <laughs> that Jesus only is the one who saves. But nevertheless, I'm not going to do that this morning. I'm going to share six ways that the transfiguration impacts our life. Six ways. The first way that it transforms our life or impacts us is that personally, okay, personally it strengthens us with hope and courage. I want to tell you something. Peter never got over this. Never. And when you read Peter's letter, First and Second Peter, Peter references this event and he does it in two different ways. First of all, in 1 Peter chapter 5, he links this with suffering. And listen to what he talks about. So I exhort the elders among you as, fellow, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Now, hold on to that for a moment. When Peter saw Jesus transfigured up on the mountain and saw His radiant glory, that glory, by the way, was veiled once again when they came down off the mountain. Jesus didn't live the rest of His life in His full glory. He veiled that glory one more time, went to the cross, and He is awaiting a return which He will come in glory and His children, His people, will be in glory like Him. So Peter here encourages the elders who are living and suffering and who are shepherding their flock. And by the way, not, this doesn't just appear uh, apply to the shepherds. This is also to the people because in other places it is given to others. He tells them that we too will be our partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed. Now quite obviously this means it hasn't been yet. So let me remind you in case you wonder, you're not in heaven yet. And heaven hasn't come to earth yet. We're still waiting on our Lord Jesus to return in His glory. But He says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you 
exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Second Peter, when Peter writes here, listen to what he says carefully because it is right in line with this transfiguration account. He says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. This is talking about the account in Matthew 17. Peter said, you know, I'm trying to tell you we have God's word given to us. We're giving God's message to you. Peter says, I wasn't fooled. I wasn't following some myth or some teaching from some man or some seminary or some religious guru. I am an eyewitness. I saw it myself. And by the way, he adds the word we, because, you know, in a Jewish culture, if you wanted to establish a truth, you had to have at least two or three witnesses. And so Jesus takes more than two, he takes three up on the mountain. Peter says, we, Peter, James, and John, were eyewitnesses of his majesty, of his glory. I mean, we saw him transformed. Now notice this, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Peter said, we knew it. John wrote about the same thing in his gospel. Listen to what John wrote. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Are you ready, folks? And we have seen his glory. I mean, this is not the glory of Jesus changing water into wine, as wonderful as that was. It's not the glory of Him raising Lazarus from the dead. What they basically said was, we saw God. We saw God on that mountain. The Word who was with God, was God, has become flesh. And He has dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. And listen to what he says. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. No one else could, could have this glory. This was God's glory that was radiant in Jesus. And this Jesus was full of grace and truth. This is our Savior, folks. And God in the flesh pulled Peter James and John as eyewitnesses so that they would come and personally see Him in His glory. A glimpse of eternity. I don't think I put this on the screen. No, I didn't. But I want to just share with you what James had to say about this in James chapter 5. James tells his followers in the church of Jerusalem, stop bickering and complaining with each other. Stop judging one another because our judge stands at the door. James saw this as well. There's a second way the transfiguration impacts us, and that is emotionally. Y'all see where I'm going? Physically, emotionally, and on down the adverbs here. But emotionally, the transfiguration teaches us that present suffering is not incompatible with future glory. Now, are y'all following me? Are y'all with me? If I was a TV now, I'd have a commercial here. I'd tell a good story and wake you up. Cause, but I want you to get this. Suffering is not incompatible with glory. Somehow Christians have bought into this prosperity concept of the gospel that if anything bad happens in my life or any suffering comes in my life, then somehow or another God is punishing me. <laughs> My word, that is the furthest thing from the truth. As a matter of fact, if you search the New Testament, basically what suffering in the will of God is, is it's a grace gift from God to you. It is an opportunity for you to suffer for Jesus 
and to glorify God in your actions, your attitude, and your behavior because one day when Jesus comes back to reward you, your glory is going to be so much greater than the person who had smooth, easy sailing in life that you're going to thank God for every moment of pain. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. That's opposite of what we always hear. But I challenge you, I challenge you to read the New Testament epistles that deal with information for the church and find out what Jesus and what God and the Apostle Paul and the writers say about suffering and the calling of a Christian and future glory for suffering well. And this is the way it's laid out. The cross before the crown. And this is exactly how Jesus demonstrated it. And this is exactly how it oftentimes happens in our life. Suffering must come before glory. Never forget that. Never get down in the dumps thinking when something happens to you that you think is bad or something that's tragic or what have you. Yes, life has its tragic moments. But you live by faith, trusting God that He knows what He's doing in your life. He'll give you strength to get through it. And as hard as it is, you press on every day. Because suffering in the present life is not incompatible with future glory. So this is so, so important. The cross before the crown. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, listen to what he said. Remember, he's the one that told Jesus, not so, Lord, you won't die. Totally changed his theology now. He told the believers, after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. Y'all following here? Transfiguration, eternal glory. Will himself... Restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. In other words, eternity changes everything. What you suffer in this life will be changed. Your identity in the next life is not equal to your suffering in this life. God will Make it right. Trust Him. You know, I hear people say all the time, well, I, I don't want to die like this, or I don't want to go out like this, or I don't want to do that. Listen to me. You trust God as your good Father who knows what's best for your life. Live for Him the best you can. And if things happen in your life, you see this as the hand of God, and you take it with the grace of God, and you live faithfully because God is one day going to restore Personally himself. Look at the text up on the screen. He will himself. He's not going to send an agent. He will do it. Restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. After you've suffered a little while. The cross before the crown. Suffering before glory. There's a third way that the transfiguration transforms us, and that is intellectually. Intellectually, it ensures us that the cross was not the end of the kingdom, but rather it was the pathway to it. You see, in Peter's mind and in James and John and the apostles and John the Baptist and all of the forerunners, Jesus was going to come. He was going to set himself up as the king. He was going to punish all evil. He was going to establish all righteousness. And everybody was going to bow at his feet. But as life usually has it, things just didn't turn out that way. You know, that's how we are. When we get married, we start having this picturesque thought of marriage. Oh, she's going to love me unconditionally. She's going to serve me my whole life. She's never going to get angry with me. And when we have children, they're all going to be perfect. They're not going to disobey. They're going to do everything we say. And then when they grow up, they're all going to be successful. They are, they're never going to have problems. They're not going to sin. They're never going to wreck cars or buy cars that break down all the time. Everything's going to be wonderful. 
and then they're going to have great jobs and they're going to go make all kinds of money and they're going to give it back to their mom and dad because we paid all this money for their diapers and education and we are going to live on the beaches of Florida forever. <laughs> and we get married. We say I do and we're so euphoric and we go get in the car and lo and behold, the front bearing comes out in the wheel on our honeymoon. And then we pull over to a restaurant and we eat something and get food poison. And for two days, think that we're on the verge of death. And because we didn't have any money, we had to turn around and come back home because I had to be at work the next day. Life is different than we think. It's so much different. And the kingdom was going to be different than they thought. It wasn't the way that Peter, James, and John planned it. But one day, it would come. The writer Luke in the book of Acts writes this, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The kingdom is not now. What's now is you are to be my witnesses because I'm building my church. And by the way, that's what we're part of today and that's why we do world missions and why we do evangelism because this is our commission now notice the rest of this because we oftentimes quit. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now can you imagine Jesus? You are to be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Samaria. And I'll be with you at the end of that. Here he goes. And they're, they're just sitting there watching him go up. And as they sit there and stare up in the clouds... I thought he was staying with us. I thought he was going to establish his kingdom now. I mean, he's crucified, he rose again. What's going on? Now notice what happens. While they were gazing into heaven, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Don't ask who they are. I don't know. Two men. Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? Because I think they were probably like this. Not again. Can you imagine? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The same one who went up will come again the same way. And by the way, if you want to know what that looks like, read Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Revelation chapter 19. You'll get a picture of what it looks like. Zechariah chapter 14, all kinds of places. He is coming again. The kingdom was not like they expected, but it will come. The transfiguration also speaks futuristically. It gives us a foretaste of what the resurrection body will be like. I started to preach this as a whole message next week, but I'll just give you a little shot today. What will your body look like after you are glorified? Well, here are two passages that just shed some light this is in 1 John chapter 2. He, Jesus, is the satisfaction. He satisfied God's wrath for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, I didn't put that in there. I got the wrong one. Scribal error. But it's chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3. And I can't let you go without me reading it because it's so good. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it didn't know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies themselves as he is pure. We will be like Jesus. 
Listen to what Paul said in Philippians. Now I'm a little nervous. Do I have the right verse? Uh, can you slide me to the next one, Brittany? Philippians chapter 3. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from heaven we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are y'all listening? Who will, not he may, he will transform our lowly body. It has the concept of a weak body. All you got to do is live a little while, folks. Just give it time. You got to color your hair. You got to get hair transplant. You got to get all this vitamins in you because your knees get joint and you have all these replacements and arthritis comes in. Then you can't remember nothing. You can't see nothing. Can't hear nothing. And, you know, all the old people look at the young people and go, I used to be like that. And the young people look at the old people and say, I'll never be like that. <clears throat> But I want to tell you something. We've got more in common than you think. <laughs> and when you get older and God lets you live long enough on this earth, you begin to appreciate something like this because one day He's going to transform our weak, lowly body with all of its frailty. Notice this. To be like His glorious body. You know, like the one we saw up on the mountain. In Paul's case, it was the one he saw on the Damascus Road. And the one he saw when he was taken up in the third heaven in 2 Corinthians. He's going to change our body like his glorious body. How's he going to do this, by the way? You say, well, I'm so old and I'm crippled and you don't know how. Listen to what he says. By the power that, is, that enables him even to subject all things. Gray hair, no hair doesn't matter. He, will, he is able to subject all things to Himself. He's going to transform your lowly body into a body like His glorious body. So listen to me, folks. Don't, don't worry about what, what you look like when you go out of here. Whatever you look like when you go out of here is not going to be what you look like when you go there. But I'm going to tell you something. You're going to be glorious and you're going to look just exactly like God wants you to look. Ladies, quit worrying whether you'll have freckles, long hair, or whether you'll be 30 or 90. It won't matter. You'll be exactly like He wants you to be. And yes, you'll be in glory. And nobody will have to go around and say, Hey, by the way, this is Moses. Moses, meet John. Uh, this is Elijah. They'll, you'll know each other. People say, Well, how do you know? Well, Peter, James, and John knew who Moses and Elijah was. They'd never seen them. And they never come over there and introduce themselves to them. There were no pictures or portraits back then, by the way. As far as we know, I, I know there was no text messages and no uh, images sent over that. They knew exactly who they were. And I love the answer that one old pastor gave on this. He said, do you think I'll know my loved ones and friends in heaven? He said, well, brother, I'd hope you'd be no dumber there than you are here. <laughs> Of course we'll know. And we won't have to go around and introduce. It'll be wonderful. Practically, and I love this, after the voice from heaven spoke, and I'm sure Peter went, they bowed down. You can imagine, just like Mount Sinai, Jesus walks over and puts his hand on them. Do not be afraid. <laughs> you know, I, I found this very interesting. No, a number of times in Scripture, Jesus puts his hand and touches someone. But why specifically Peter, James, and John? All kinds of reasons. But did you know that these three men died in different ways? And perhaps Jesus was letting them know that, listen, I'm going to a cross to be butchered. You have a way to die. You have a way to die. You have... But don't fear. I am with you. Listen to how Peter, he would be the first disciple to be told of his death. In John chapter 21, Jesus said, Peter, they are going to stretch out your hands and carry you where you don't want to go. And church history tells us that's exactly how Peter died by crucifixion. The only difference was he asked to be turned upside down because he wasn't worthy to die like his Lord. James would be the first disciple who was actually put to death 
And the way he died was he was sawed in two by his persecutors. The Apostle John was exiled to an island, and most people believe that he died as an aged old man who was just placed there to sit. And by the way, sometimes this is harder than martyrdom for all of our older people. Sometimes it's so much harder just to sit where you are because you feel like you've been shelved, that you're not worthy, that you're not useful. Listen to me. You take these last years of your life and you get in the glory cloud. You get in God's Word every day. You seek His presence. You pray. You intercede. You call people. You encourage them. Invite them over. Share some of your wisdom with them. God's not finished with you, so stop thinking He is. Okay, that was my sermon, by the way. I'm going to tell this one on Jim Edmonds, and I try to go see Jim every few weeks. Jim's 90 years old plus. Can't see. Says he can't hear, but he hears pretty good with his, with his new gadgets in. Yeah, you hear me. Jim's wife passed away some time back. Jim knows the exact years, days, everything that he's been married. He keeps track of it. But since that time, he has devoted his life to a devotional study of God's Word. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. I went in there. Jim had praise and worship music on. He didn't know I was coming. I gave him a one-minute notice. I walked in his house. There's all of his devotional books laid out, his Bible laid out, his handwriting, which is immaculate. And I go in there, and this music is lifted. I want to tell you something. I left there feeling like I was in a glory cloud. Before I leave, I always ask Jim, Jim, I want you to pray with me. And Jim starts praying. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. You can, you can tell somebody that talks to God. You can feel God's presence. And I just began to feel this presence from God just wash, wash over me. So right there sits a man who's got all kinds of time. And if you need encouragement and you need wisdom in life, you need spiritual guidance, you catch him before he goes and ask him if you can schedule an appointment to get into the glory cloud because I think he'll show you where it's at. Jesus put his hand on them. Spiritually, by the way, it teaches us that Jesus alone saves. Not Moses, not Elijah, Jesus only. When they departed, they saw no one except Jesus only. He's greater than the law. He's greater than the prophets. He is God's Son. He is the one that God sent to provide our salvation and our eternal home. Peter writes in Acts chapter 4, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who you crucified, who God raised from the dead, by Him... This man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name, not Moses, not Elijah, Jesus only. There is no other name under heaven given Two men by which we must, must be saved. If we are depending on anything or anyone else other than Jesus only and His death and His resurrection for our sin, we are wrong because there is no other one who can save Jesus only. Have you put your hope, your trust, your eternal destiny into the hands and the person and the work of Jesus Christ? If you have not done that, today is the day of salvation for you. And this is what you do. You simply say, Dear Lord Jesus, I have never believed on you and what you did for me, for my eternal life. But today... Today, I trust you and what you did as my only source of salvation. 
Thank you for dying for me and giving me the gift of eternal life. I believe you. And if you will do that according to the authority of God's word, he will save you and he will indwell you with his spirit and he will take you all the way to glory. I hope you've done that. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the message of our wonderful Savior, the glorious, glorified Lord Jesus Christ, scorned by men, exalted by you. Father, he veiled himself in mystery, in flesh, but you, O oh God, have lifted him up so that his name is above every name and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord and they will do it to the glory of you, our God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for salvation. If there's anyone here who has not believed on Jesus, open their heart, grant them, Father, what they need to believe and to have the free gift of everlasting life.